everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much. I really appreciate that. And I, of course, thanks so much for inviting me to be part of the TEDx uh, uh, series. It's a great honor to be here. It's a great honor, by the way, to be able to speak to young people. Um, I'm a university professor as well as an artist. I've recently started a magazine to be able to highlight my students' best photography. Um, and so anyway, I want to just sort of show you some of my photographic series, some of the work that I've done over the last 30 years, and sort of talk to, to you about how I got here or how I got to where I was going to going to, to, to be as a career. Um, you know, one of the things is, especially as an artist, we don't have a very clear, direct path. It's not like, so for an accountant or maybe a nurse, that you get a certain degree, you go to monster.com, you find the spot, you put in your resume. For artists, one of the things that we have to do is basically sort of be creative and find opportunities for ourselves. And I'd always like to quote one of the great photographers, which is Ansel Adams, and I'm going to paraphrase him to say one of the things, the great things he said was that opportunity favors the prepared mind. And what he meant by that, and what, what I mean by that, is that you need to have a lot of basically tools at your disposal. This is why we go to school. This is why we study math. This is why we study history. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm never going to use algebra or something like that. Let me tell you, you don't know what you're going to need in the future. You don't know what the future is going to bring. And we do know that change is happening incredibly rapidly in our lives. For somebody who's like relatively old, like me, 55 years old, I graduated from high school in 75. Computers were an imaginary thing of the future, except for a handful of you know, kids that were in the computer club or something like that. And now we all know that we carry these powerful tools in our pockets with us at all times. Um, so anyway, which one of the great things that we're going to be doing throughout our careers and throughout our lives is continually educating ourselves. It's not just about being prepared for something I think I'm going to do tomorrow or the next day. It's being prepared for the rest of your lives with your photographs. Um, this is a photographic series I want to show you about people with HIV and AIDS. And you all heard about that terrible, deadly disease for many, many years. Fortunately, in the mid, late, mid to late 90s, there were some great medical breakthroughs that allowed it to be much more manageable. I photographed in New York City, which was one of the epicenters of the crisis, uh, for 10 years, photographing people with AIDS and telling their stories. Um, I also got, had the privilege of working for newspapers and magazines uh, that were working with people with HIV and AIDS. Uh, to be able to tell some of the stories. I would meet individuals such as this woman here, Donna Martinez, in the white shirt there. She's a born-again <clears throat> born Christian in her church in Brooklyn, New York. Um, Donna had like seven kids, and it wasn't until her, she was pregnant with her seventh that she found out that she had HIV. And at this point, there was no treatment. She found out her husband had HIV. There was no treatment for either of them. Uh, fortunately, her kids were all negative, um, <clears throat> but the fate of those two parents was, was not good. When my book, I had a book published in 1999, and when it came out, I sent them a copy, and it came back with the words deceased written on it. And of course, I was heartbroken, and I was devastated by that, though I did know that one of the things that I was trying to do this whole time was to tell people stories. Here's a young man holding a picture of his good friend who had HIV and died. Um, one of the things that I did the whole time when I was photographing, working on this project, was to meet as many diverse people as possible. So it wasn't just like one kind of person, this kind of person or that kind of person. And the idea clearly was to point out that HIV does not discriminate. It doesn't care who you are. It doesn't care if you're rich or poor or black or white or Asian or Latino. It doesn't care. And it's going to try to kill you. And so one of the messages, of course, for this whole project was how important it was for people, especially young people, to be protecting themselves. Obviously, this means that when you become sexually active, you have to be using safe sex. And of course, you definitely never, ever, ever, ever use intravenous drugs like that. It just becomes an obvious thing because we see the way that the disease uh, has just devastated people's lives and, and destroyed people's families and their lives and their careers. I was very fortunate in that I was able to go through um, with a doctor, a Dr. Jeffrey Wallach, who was treating people with HIV and AIDS in New York, and he was one of the few doctors who would do it. During, you know, during the late 80s or early 90s, doctors didn't know what to do. They were scared of people with HIV and AIDS, even though their job was to be healers. Um, hospitals were scared of people. Funeral homes wouldn't, wouldn't accept the bodies. And so it was really a devastating time. And that fortunately, that time is behind us. By the, early, by the late 90s, one of the amazing things that was happening was that 
when I would go back and see people, and this was one of my modus operandi, one of my usual things is if I take your picture, I always want to come back and see you a couple weeks later and give you a print. And I was shooting all film at the time, so it was a little slower process, and I would make these original prints, and I would bring them back and give them to people. And the reason for that was I wanted to make sure they got a picture. I wanted to give something back to them. It was like, wow, you let me take a picture of you, and now I want to say thank you by giving you a print. Also, it was a little bit that when I brought the picture back, I would ask them, would, can I use this picture? I'd like you to sign a model release. Now, typically, if you're doing commercial photography, you have people just sign model releases right away. It's understood. But when I was dealing with people that I knew that had, there was confidentiality issues, and of course, there was just that specter of death was holding over, hanging over many people's heads. And so I felt it was really an important moral and ethical obligation on my part to go back and see the people and give them the pictures like that. It also had a practical purpose, which was that when I met people, I got to give them these pictures, and that then they would hang them in their house, and then a friend would come over and say, wow, that's a really nice picture. Where'd you get that? And say, oh, well, there's this guy, Tom, and he's looking to tell the stories of people with HIV and AIDS. Uh, and so people would start to call me like that. And so consequently, I met people who were activists. That is, they were actively involved in saying something about the crisis and trying to reach out to other people for age awareness and education, which is one of the number one things. When it was an incurable disease, that's all there was, education and awareness. Be aware of it and understand how this is transmitted. Now, of course, what happened was I went back and met a couple of people. And when I gave them the pictures, they said, oh, guess what, my HIV is no longer present in my body. And I'm like, what? No. You know, people had a lot of brain issues, so I thought, oh, they're hallucinating or something. I go back a second person, they said the same thing, and I realized, oh my God, that there's this great medical breakthrough. One of the things that you also you do that I've done as a photographer and that you will be doing throughout your lives, of course, is researching and staying informed about issues that are important to you. So I would read everything I could possibly find on HIV and AIDS, and then I started hearing about this combination drug therapy that allowed people uh, to live, you know, to live reasonable, healthy lives, even though they had the virus. Uh, this particular picture, which is one of the saddest pictures that I've ever made, and it usually makes me cry, and I'll try not to cry right now, but uh, I met this man, Willie Sandoval, and Willie was one of those tough street guys, Everybody liked him, everybody respected him, and people who didn't, they feared him. He was a guy who hung out on the corner in this tough neighborhood in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. And when he got sick, he decided he had to do something with his life. He had two little girls, and he basically had been a gang member, had been a drug addict, a thief, and, and he was one of those people, too, that if he had have had the educational opportunities that you have and that I had, this guy would be a great writer, an incredible speaker, an amazing thinker. This guy had what we used to call the gift of gab. He could talk to anybody, anytime, anywhere. He could tell amazing stories. But because of those circumstances and bad choices on his part, it's never, it's, you always got to remember, there's not just circumstances, there's choices that we make. And he made a lot of bad choices, and he knew that. But when he became sick, and he knew that his time was probably going to run out, he decided he was going to do something because he didn't want his kids to think he was a bum. And, you know, that was one of the most powerful things, that he wanted to give his children something to remember him by, other than just having been this, you know, tough guy on the street and all that. And so then he started doing outreach into people who were drug addicts and going into these horrible places where people would really rent syringes and, 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 and be shooting drugs in these abandoned buildings. And because he was a tough street guy, he could go in there with credibility and speak to people and really bring, uh, bring awareness about what was going on here. Um, this, that, that, this particular picture was at his funeral, obviously. His parents, his sister called me and said, Tom, come finish your project, because I'd been photographing him for a while. And it was one of those magical moments when I raised the camera to take a picture of him in the casket. His 13-year-old daughter walked up, put her hand on his head, looked at me, and walked away. And within that split second, I took that picture, and it was one that's haunted me ever since. I'd have to tell you the good news is that a few years ago, I got a phone call out of the blue from a woman had said, my name is Yakima Sandoval. Do you remember me? I go, yes, I remember you. I took that picture of you at your dad's, uh, at your dad's uh, very, very sad funeral. And she's fortunately a very successful optometrist in Connecticut now, has a couple of kids. Um, when her father died, since he was mostly a you know, very poor guy, people just threw out everything he had, basically. But I had this large collection of photographs, and I was able to give to her, which I was really, really pleased about. 
So I photographed many people over 10 different years uh, with the AIDS crisis who, who were suffering from HIV and AIDS. This particular guy was, I was super impressed with. His name's Mike St. Hilaire. And uh, Mike was lived in a very small town upstate New York. Um, he was the only person, of course, in his town that anyone would know of that had AIDS. And he had the great courage to be able to come out and talk to people about what, it, what the disease was. And again, that education awareness to be able to, of course, warn young people about the dangers and how they could sort of protect themselves. Is really an American hero, I would say. This next series of pictures uh, was about pro wrestlers. So I've got kind of some really intense, intense subject to something a lot more fun. I live in San Bernardino, and one day I was riding my bike a couple of blocks from my house, and there was this old storefront that said School of Hard Knocks, professional wrestling training. I'm like, ah, get out of here, you know, that's got to have been closed for how long? Well, I rode my bike around back, and I heard this boom, boom. And I go in there, and there was a small ring in this little storefront with about a dozen or so young men and women learning how to be pro wrestlers under the, uh, under the uh, training of a, of a retired pro wrestler, Jesse Hernandez. And for five years then, I started photographing. I would go to their practice sessions. I would go to their matches. I would meet with them individually to be able to photograph them. And one of the things I really wanted to do about why I was so interested in the pro wrestling was that as a teacher, you know, I would meet my students and some of them, you know, I'm sure like some of you guys, some of you are very motivated, probably everybody that's in this room because you came on a Saturday is a motivated student, but there's others that aren't so motivated. And one of the things I was really moved by when I met these young men and women who were pro wrestlers is that they had this burning desire to make something of themselves. They had a dream that they were pursuing. It was like, you know, if you drive by a schoolyard at midnight and you see that guy who's doing those shots, who's playing hoops, kid who's doing like foul shots, one after the other, practicing, practicing, practicing. Um, and that's what I saw in these young men and women, a burning desire and a determination to make something of themselves. And I've often tell my university students, hey, if you guys were half as motivated as those pro wrestlers, you'd all have, you'd have to be straight A's and go into the best graduate schools. Um, so it was a really interesting uh, experience. The other thing was that I had to have a strategy about how was I going to photograph them. Was I going to show the real person or was I going to instead show the character? And I chose to do the character. So, you know, pro wrestling, you've all seen on TV, everybody's big and bad and they take on outrageous personas. And of course, it's, it's part acting, naturally. But of course, they have to be in amazing physical condition because the conflict you see, especially in a small place like the School of Hard Knocks, it's real. You can't get away with some big fake punch. You've got to actually hit people there. Otherwise, the audience is so close, they'll boo you off the stage for being a bunch of phonies. Um, and so I decided that I chose to photograph them within their character. And what I found was so interesting about that was that these characters that they created, in my mind, really kind of represented our popular culture. Um, there's a thing called the zeitgeist. It's a great German word, and it represents kind of what's the general mood about the times that we live in right now. And we know that we are certainly very interested in celebrities. We're very interested in becoming celebrities. You see, of course, with all the you know unscripted reality TV shows, people do practically anything to be on TV. All kinds of you know obnoxious things, as well as personally humiliating things, just to be on TV. And there's also that drive for. Um, uh, for, for fame and fortune, as well as there's this thing about sex and money, and it seemed like, wow, that was pro wrestling really represented all of that, this blurring of fact and fiction. Because when you're watching pro wrestling, you, never, you, know, you know it's choreographed, you know that it's staged, but it's not exactly fake, because I tell you, any one of us get in the ring, we would be hurt really bad immediately. So there's this constant blurring of fact and fiction that I thought was so perfect about our, that represented our time right now in the United States and in our culture, which I found really fascinating. I was very fortunate, too, in that I was able to publish a book of this work in 2010. Um, this is one of my favorite, I'm sorry, these are all kind of cut off there, but here's a big rustler walking into the room, and I love this family in the front where the dad looks kind of like, yeah, it looks cool, where the mom's kind of admiring, like, ooh, he's kind of handsome, and the little kid is like, oh my God, that guy's huge, which he certainly was. There they are flying through the air. It was neat. Again, just like with the AIDS Project, I always bring pictures back to people. It's one of my just personal things. It's like, after I photograph you, I want to give you pictures. And the other thing was that I also told the wrestlers they could use my pictures. They could do whatever they wanted with them. They could use them on their website. They could use them as publicity. And that was totally cool. And so there was a real act of sort of sharing and trust that happened over working on that project for many years like that. 
Cash Money Brothers. <laughs> My most recent project, I have numerous projects, and one of the things as an artist is the longer you work, sort of the more energy you have. The more sort of creative ideas you have, the more things I can work on at one time. And so as you mature as people, you'll notice that you can basically do more things. You'll be able to do writing. You'll be able to do probably some kind of music, maybe some sort of creative things as well as some intellectual things. You'll be able to have a job and a family and hobbies. Do all those wonderful things. Keep many balls up in the air like that. But I can tell you it doesn't come easy. There was a great artist named Chuck Close. And even though this, I know this event is very much about inspiration, one of his remarks he made was, inspiration's for amateurs, the rest of us just get to work. And that is a very, very important aspect to know that things do not, are not gonna come easy to you. I mean, some of us are very talented. Some can sing well, some can draw well, some can do math incredibly well. I'm not one of those people. I'm just a middle class guy who's just sort of working hard and trying to do the best I can. And I know that hard work is the number one thing for me right there. Um, I've been photographing now people in their cars at the Route 66 rendezvous in San Bernardino. What I love about this is it allows me to do street portraiture, um, and it also lets me hang out with all these people with these really cool cars. But the other thing I'm doing is I'm kind of sneakily looking into the back seat to see what's going on. Um, generally in photography, it's a real no-no to be a voyeur that is spying on people, but since they're out there in this public venue, public, public place where people are there to be seen and there to be photographed, I have this, what I certainly feel is a ethical license to be able to peek into people's cars and take pictures. And so I get to see like the groups of kids in the backs of the cars, you know, people always flashing little peace signs, I'm not sure exactly why, and smiling at me. Some people grumble and sort of look tough at me. Um, some people just look really interesting and sort of for whatever reasons, like this kid kind of looks like a mannequin, I always thought, or this woman sort of smiling and waving, waving to me. And so throughout my career, what I've done is find projects that I'm interested in and then passionate and then pursue it with all my might. And that's one of the things that I can sort of try to leave you guys with is that finding those things in your life that are important to you. Hey, and you know, most of us can't be all that's righteous about what we do to make a living, but I can tell you, you can be righteous about what you do with your time. How do you spend it? We live in a great entertainment culture, but there's more to life than entertainment. There's the, there's the, there's the power that comes from doing something that you think is good, that you think is righteous, that you think is meaningful in your life. And I can tell you, doing something meaningful in your life, volunteering, doing something good for other people is gonna create a certain sense of satisfaction that transcends money, power, that we see you know, on media all the time. So what I wanna do is leave you with the idea that you need to strive, you need to work hard. Inspiration is, is essential, but so is hard work. And that another great, uh, uh, a quote that I would always give you, the one from Ansel Adams, would be that opportunity favors the prepared mind. The more prepared you are, the more that opportunities will come up and you'll be able to take advantage of them. And so what I want to sort of leave you with is to be, keep expanding your horizons, keep reaching out there, working hard, and find those things that you're passionate about, because those are things that are going to take you through your entire life. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day.